Hello Digital DJ Tips family, it's Phil here with another Tuesday Tips Live. It's great to have you here and I hope you're going to enjoy the next half hour or so of tuition we have for you because it is tuition today. Today we're talking about manual beat mixing or manual beat matching. We're talking about why it's important and how you can learn it in half the time or at least with half the effort that some people find it takes. So I'm going to share a little secret uh, that a friend of mine came up with many years ago and that I still teach to this day about how it's done. So if you're new to all of this and you think, what the hell am I watching here? You're with Digital DJ Tips. We are the biggest DJ school in the world and we teach. We have DJ courses, we have digitaldjtips.com, but we also have this YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Mixcloud Live channel that you're watching this on now, where every Tuesday and Thursday we go live from our studios here in Gibraltar and teach you something, answer your questions, try and help you become better DJs and better DJ producers. A lot of what we teach is based upon what's in this book, Rock the Dance Floor, which you'll find on Amazon. It's our bestseller on how to DJ, but I also want you to have a copy of that book, which I'll tell you how to get a copy of later on. However, this tip was based upon something in another book. It was based upon something written in DJing for Dummies. If you remember the white, uh, the, the, the yellow and black book, I actually had my copy with me to bring in and I forgot to bring it to the studio today. Uh, the yellow and black book in the, in the kind of For Dummies series, it's by a guy called John Stevenson. And I was involved in that book. I was the technical editor of it. Uh, and so I uh, was, my job was to check everything in it was, was correct and that I, I felt it was the right information. And one thing that I always loved in, in John's book was his method for teaching manual beat, beat matching because his book was written for turntables basically. Uh, and back then, you know, we had to manually beat match. So it's John's technique I'm teaching you here now or John's little twist, little trick. So thank you if you're watching John for that. Right, are you ready to learn some manual beat mixing? Let's start then, let's have a look at how to do this. So what I've got set up here is uh, DDJ 400, a very simple controller. You can learn to do this on pretty much all gear. By the way, you should, you should learn to do this, even if you've got the sync button, even if you've got all the bells and whistles of modern gear, because you never know when you're gonna need to mix into another DJ, or you might wanna have a go on turntables, or you might have a track that isn't playing ball when you hit sync. Being able to do this is really empowering. Also means you can take advanced mixing training. Again, I'll tell you about our current advanced mixing training in a bit. So definitely try and do this. So I've got a DDJ 400 here, which we're gonna learn on. Before we start though, I don't want that thing in the middle there at all. Let's get it away. Before we start though, one first thing you wanna do, turn away your laptop. I don't want you to look at your laptop. I want you to load two house tracks up on your laptop and that's it. In fact, let's just turn it back while I check I've got those loaded up okay. But seriously, once we've done this, no laptop. You don't see the waveforms, you don't see the BPMs or anything. But I'll talk through with the laptop there so that, uh, so that you can see what I'm doing or so that I can see what I'm doing. Uh, so on the first deck, on one deck, so on the right hand deck say, uh, I've got a, a house track, sounds like this. It's always a good idea to do this with house music. House music with a beat and not much else going on because that makes beat mixing a lot easier for you to understand. So I've got a simple house track and I've actually looped. You see on the screen there, there's a loop going on, right? I've actually looped that beat. So that's never gonna change. And this is what I'm gonna mix over the top of. This is what I'm gonna be mixing into, if you like, with the other track. So on the other deck, I've loaded another track. There you go. See that there now? And at the beginning of that track, that first beat, I'm gonna put a cue point. I'm just gonna hit Q on my temporary cues down here. So that's now on the beginning of that track. And now I'm gonna turn my laptop away. So on the screen, you can see my waveform. Just stop that playing for a second. Uh, but I can't. I'm now running off what I can see in front of me. I've got no BPMs, I've got no waveforms, I've got no nothing. So to make it a bit harder, because I know one of these tracks is at 124 BPM and one is at 125, I can't remember which. But to make it a bit harder, let's mess around with the tempos. Let's put the tempo on the outgoing track somewhere quite slow. So that's a little bit below the zero. So that now sounds like this. It could be a bit higher. 
it doesn't really matter, but don't put it on naught because you kind of know it's likely to be a certain BPM. I think it's best to put it away from naught, so it's down there a bit. Now, here's the trick, or here's one of the tricks. On the other deck, I'm gonna speed this all the way up to the top, so it's really fast. Sounds like a techno track, right? So I know now that this track is a lot faster than this one. This is the first trick. I now know when I'm beat mixing, when I'm trying to mix this track in on the, the new deck with the old track, I know it's a lot faster. So I've only got to go in one direction. I've only got to slow it down. So all this stuff about, is, the, is this track faster or slower than that one? Whoa, it takes it out of the equation. I know it's faster because I've just made it faster. So John's trick is always start with the track you're mixing in in a position where you know for sure it's faster than the one you're mixing in too. So I've done that now. This one's really fast. And this one, it's its normal tempo. A bit faster, a bit slower, but it's somewhere around the normal tempo. On the screen, you can see what tempos these are set at now, uh, which is part of the game here. I can't. My laptop's turned away here. I can't see it. I'm running blind. So my job now is to mix this one in over this one. So let's talk about how we do that. So. The first thing you do when you're beat mixing is you turn down the track that you're mixing in. That's off now. You can't hear that now. I couldn't hear it then because I didn't press play. But you know, you can't hear that now. Now, this track we can hear. It's coming out of my speaker here. Speaker, you say? Where's your second speaker, Phil? Well, this is the other bit of learning to manually beat mix that is a real help. Ditch one of your speakers. I've only got one speaker here and it makes it a lot easier when you're getting started at this. I'll explain why now. In our headphones, we're gonna to listen to the incoming track, the one that you can't hear, this one here. I can hear it in my headphones. If I put those there, yeah, can you hear that? But our crowd can't hear that. It's not coming out of the speaker like that. So you're gonna to listen to this track in your headphones by pressing the Q button. That's what these Q buttons are for. That'll play it through your headphones because you said, let me cue it into my headphones. That's what it means. So this is gonna go on one of your ears. So if you put your headphones on, which ear to you feels the most natural, that one or that one? For me, it's this one always. So therefore, on the other side of my desk, I'll have the speaker. So in other words, the speaker is replacing this headphone, or if you want to think of it another way, this headphone is replacing that speaker. So each of my ears has got something to listen to. And actually, you're going to adjust the volume. So this track's playing now. Uh, and this track here, I'm not going to try and beat mix or anything. I'm just going to start it. You can't hear it, but I can. I'm going to adjust the volume of this, of this so that if I close my eyes, each ear is about the same volume. That's about as loud as that in my ear. That's important because it gives you a soundscape around your head to learn manual beat mixing. Because what we're going to do is we're going to have the incoming track that no one can hear on our headphone. And here, we're going to have what everyone can hear in, in, in our room or our recording or our practice session, what the, what the crowd can hear, if you like. And then we're going to keep trying to get this one to the right speed by slowing it down and slowing it down and slowing it down. That's the, the aim here. So... Normally, that's what I would do. Normally, I'd start this playing. I'd start this playing. Oh, it's too fast. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Now, it's no good for you now learning because you can't hear the other deck. So what I'm going to do just for the purposes of learning is turn up the other deck. So now both decks are playing out loud. We would never do this until we were sure the beat mix was right in, in a real DJ set. But for, for the sake of you, now you can hear that one, that really fast one, and you can hear that one there. So... Let's do it. Let's do a manual beat mix. So the first thing I'm going to do is start, set this one playing. And I'm gonna start counting because we want to be on a one beat. A one beat is a beat at the beginning of a bar and a bar is every four beats. So listen to the beat. Now instinctively we start counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That one beat at the beginning of that little phrase I've looped it's just got a bit more to it than the other beats it's important that you line up a one beat on the incoming track 
with a 1 beat on the outgoing track. Now, there's more to it than that, but for the sake of learning beat mixing with just beats playing, that's all you need to know. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. No, that's not right. Listen. That's it. 1, 2, 3, 4. Have that count going in your head. 1, 2, 3, 4. And on the 1 beat, I'm going to start this play. Now, this is the first beat of the track, so I know it's on a 1 beat. 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Whoa! That's way too fast, right? I'm listening in my headphones like this. Let's try it again. Whoa! That's obviously way too fast, right? So, we're going to slow that down a little bit. I'm going to slow this down on the tempo fader. A decent amount, because that's too fast. So, let's have another go. 1, 2, 3, 4. Way too fast. But did you notice that that took a little bit longer to go wrong? The first beat sounded all right. One, two, three, four. It went off after like beat two or beat three. We still need to slow it down a bit. Let's slow it down a bit more. Okay, let's have another go. I'm ready here to start this track on a one beat. I'm holding my headphones to my ear off camera. Three, four. Now, it's obviously gone out of time now, but that was actually a lot better, wasn't it? It was getting a lot closer. Slow it down a bit more. Three, four, one, two, three, four. That's not bad. But it's maybe slipping off after beat five or beat six. We still need to slow down. And this is the trick. Now, if you think this seems tedious, in the old days, we didn't have a cue button. We had to take the needle off the record, put it back to the beginning, line it up, and then try again. So manual beat mixing on controllers is a lot easier than it was on records. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Now it's still too fast, but that's a lot better, right? You can hear that. Slow it down a tiny bit more. Let's try again. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That sounds quite close. Let's try again. Now at this stage, it really helps to have the headphones on one ear and listen to the other ear on there. Because I can hear it's going a bit too fast. So instead of going back to the beginning, I can just nudge it. And if you get lost, Either go, like I'm lost now. No problem, hit Q, back to the beginning. One, two, three, four. Headphones. And I'm nudging, instead of going back to the beginning on the Q button, I'm using this. Now because I'm having to slow it down quite a lot, I know I've still got to slow it down a bit here. Use your headphones, like this. They're holding together quite well now, aren't they? I still think this one's a little bit fast. Slow it down a tiny bit more. Nudge it a bit more. It might be... Yeah, it's still a little bit fast. So I'm just going to do one more final little slowdown here. Back to the beginning on the cue point. Let's do our real mix now. So let's pretend that I've done all this in the headphones and now I'm actually going to turn it up live for the crowd, even though you had it up live so you can hear me there. Headphones. Headphones, it's going off, but I'm not sure where. It's a little bit fast. I'm going like this. Really helps with that. Still a little bit fast. There you go, that's better again. Even in even live in the mix, you can slow it down a little bit on your decks.
And by listening like this, it's quite easy to spot which one is slightly out. But that is not a bad mix. There you go, there's track one, track two. Track one is still a tiny bit fast, but that's basically nicely in time there. And that's how to manually beat mix in half the time because you're always slowing it down until you get to that very end bit when you just do those little adjustments. So there's a couple of things you need to know about this to have the most chance of success. Number one is when you're starting the track on that one, two, three, four, on the one, definitely try and press it bang on the one. If you press it a bit earlier or a bit late, you can always go up here and quickly nudge it forwards or backwards just to get it in line, just to quickly fix that. But it's always best to start it on the one. The second thing is, notice that I made small adjustments live. You know, you don't always have to go back to the beginning. Only if you get locked. Excuse me, only if you get lost do you have to go back to the beginning with the cue point. The cue point's definitely worth going back to when you're early on and the beats are way out, but as soon as they're getting close, there's no need, you can just correct it using the jog wheels. And the third thing is, uh, you saw me do it then. If you start to get lost in the mix, don't panic. Instead, calmly put your headphone back on your ear, other ear tune into that speaker and say, is this one faster or slower? And when you get used to separating the track that's coming in, which is always going to be on one ear because you choose your ear, with what the rest of the crowd can hear if you like, it actually becomes quite easy to separate those two things. And it's a, a learned skill that you can certainly improve by using that level control so that your headphones are not too loud or too quiet against your speaker. You definitely want that kind of soundscape going on around your head where if you close your eyes, it's almost like you're inside both songs, um, but one of them's here and one of them's here, and then it makes it easier to make the adjustment. You know, this is a bit like riding a bike. It's one of those things in DJing that you uh, either get quickly or it takes a bit longer, but it'll never be immediately. But once you've got it, you never forget it, just like riding a bike. Oh, for fun, you can already see this, but I'm gonna pull this round and see how close I got. So one track was on 123.58 on this deck here, and this, in the end, this track here was just a tiny, tiny bit slower. That final adjustment just pushed it slower. One, two, three, point three, three. They were 0.15 of a BPM apart. If you are within about a quarter of a BPM, uh, you're absolutely fine. That mix will carry on fine with just the tiniest nudge for, you know, long enough to do a really nice beat mix. So I kind of passed the test and I was within a quarter. I normally get it to within uh, a tenth. So I'm a bit disappointed with myself there, but hey, we are live in front of hundreds of people. You know, in the old days, we never had any of that. It was all by ear, and I'm sure most of our beat mixes were half a BPM off here and there. Uh, but yeah, I'm, all, I'm reasonably happy with that. Uh, so uh, there you go, there's the proof of it. Left hand deck, one, two, three, point three, three. Right hand one, one, two, three, point five, eight. And that is how to manually beat mix in half the time. Look, uh, this has been a long, lesson for me without chatting to you guys and girls and this is normally about chatting to you guys and girls so i'll tell you what we'll do we'll go back to the main comment cam uh, and let's say hello let's meet let me just get that camera a little bit higher i was doing a sat down meeting with that camera a little while ago uh, which is why it was uh, low uh, welcome everyone uh, let's see what you are uh, asking about this um, so terry says a good technique phil I'll give that a try. Brilliant DJ set yesterday. House music is the best. Yeah, I did an old school DJ set yesterday. So if, uh, if anyone wants to hear that, uh, it's, on, uh, it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for that. Um, so DJ Exclusive says, yep, I've been doing that since the 80s. Yep, well, you know, good on you. So have I. Uh, but a lot of people haven't. Scott says, uh, a great lesson, Phil. Thank you very much. Must the BPM be the same? No, but you want to get it close. You know, the, the BPM is exact, which is what happens when you hit the sync button, then the tracks are locked forever, which is the, the holy grail. You know, the idea is to get the BPM as close as possible. Uh, the tracks you choose, the BPM shouldn't be the same. Deliberately choose two tracks that are slightly different and then do what I did, mess them up a bit. You know, as long as they're within three or four BPM of each other, it's fine. So, um, uh, Mike says, I use sync when I'm using four decks to overlay loops and vocals, but regardless, if you sync for this, if you think sync, sync for that or just to mix two records, you have to know this. Thanks to Phil for teaching us today. You do have to know this. It's a good thing to know, not least because uh, it means you can do a lot of stuff that we teach in our courses. For instance, our house mixing mastery course, which is uh, this one here, by the way. It's currently 
35% off just literally for the next couple of days because we just launched it. You know, we assume that you can correct a mix in the way I've just shown you, even though you might be using your sync button in our courses. So while you can take our courses without knowing this, it's certainly a good idea to practice this stuff. Uh, so again, that's that link if you want to have a look at House Mixing Mastery. It's our new course, um, which is 35% off, but literally only for another day or two, I think. So do uh, scribble that link down if you're interested in that. Uh, so more comments. Um, Lee says, riding the pitch is a good way to keep beats aligned without ha uh, hearing pitch shifts. So let's talk a little bit about that, Lee. Uh, yes, you're right, it is. So riding the pitch, let's go back to the decks and I'll explain riding the pitch to you. Riding the pitch is when instead of nudging the decks like this to keep them in time with each other, which is actually speeding and slowing that track down, speeding it, no, it's slowing it down here and speeding it up. Instead of doing this, you adjust the pitch fader very slightly until they're back in time and then you move it back again. It is an advanced way of beat mixing and I wouldn't recommend it for beginners because it adds an extra layer of difficulty over the top. But laid back Luke, for instance, that's the only way he does this. So yes, a really valid point there. Thank you for sharing that. Would you recommend beat matching in headphones solely? Uh, let's get rid of that overlay there, shall we? That's a little bit out of place, isn't it? Uh, would you recommend mixing in beat, uh, head mixing, uh, beat mixing in headphones solely using the Q-mix function? Yes, that's another easy way of doing it, especially if you're not allowed to DJ with speakers. So if you're going to use the Q-mix function, again, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back here and get that main screen on again. So I'll show you. There's a knob called Q-mix here. And what Q-mix does is, it decides whether what's going down your headphones is only what you're listening to on the Q buttons. In other words, something that you've said, I want to listen to away from the main mix or the main mix when it's turned that way or a mix of the two. And it's perfectly possible to DJ with that in the middle where your Q is coming through. In almost like in, the, in exactly the same way I was just showing you when I had both faders up so you could hear what I was doing. That's what will, will be happening on your headphones if you mix that way. But the audience is only hearing the deck that you've got selected here, for instance. Uh, it is a little bit harder, and I would recommend trying to learn on speakers first, but yes, it is possible to do that. There's often a button called Split Cue uh, on bigger mixers and bigger DJ controllers, which, it, which again can approximate more what I just said. You get the cue through one headphone and the master through the other, which is closer to what I just did then with the speaker. Uh, but most DJ controllers don't have that, which is why I wasn't, I wasn't teaching that then. Uh, so, The next comment, and I'm just looking for comments and ways I can help you with this. Uh, does the key have to be the same also? Great question. Look, don't run before you can walk. Learning manual beat mixing is hard. So pick two tracks that have just got a beat and practice that. There are rules to house mixing that mean that yes, the key does have to be the same in a lot of circumstances. And it's one of the seven rules of house mixing that we teach at the beginning of that course that I was just telling you about uh, that you can find out more about there. Yeah, so yes, key mixing is, is important. It doesn't always have to be there. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a lots, lots of ways that you can mix tracks that are in a different key and make them sound good. But it's one of the rules of mixing is don't overlay discordant harmonic stuff over other over, over two pieces of harmonic uh, stuff because it will be if it's going to be discordant. Uh, or as again, as our friend Luke says, if it's out of key, mix quickly. If it's in key, mix slowly. I love that. He makes it very simple. Uh, Brent says that's a very similar technique to the way I've been doing it. Well, it looks like you've been doing it right, Brent. Uh, hello to Dennis. It's always good to have you here, Dennis. Uh, so uh, I'm looking for other comments. Kimberly's agreeing. Yes, I rarely have my headphones on both ears. DJs generally have them around their necks or on one ear, right? Unless you want to hear the next track, you're like, is this a good track? Do I really want to play this? Then I like to put them on my ears and kind of lose, lose myself in the music. Um, so more comments on this. Uh, sync comes in handy, but you can't beat manual beat mixing. Uh, I can hear horses galloping in the track. That can't sound right. Well, no, it uh, wasn't right until I hopefully got it close enough. Um, so Jack says, to be fair, we did have our BPMs on the record jacket to help get it in the ballpark quickly. Yeah, you used to have stickers on the records with BPM written on it. I used to have the key written on some of mine as well. Uh, Musami says, I follow your videos religiously. I absolutely love the tips and advice. By the way, just to be clear, what I was showing you then wasn't like this is how to mix two tracks. It was this is how to manually beat mix. Uh, the tracks were totally arbitrary. I just pulled two tracks out of my collection. Um, one of them was looped. You know, I wasn't like this is a perfect mix. I was like, this is how to get the beats in line. Um, 
I only use sink when I have to go pee really badly at a show, says Sex Hool Panda. Yeah, because of course, uh, a beat sink will lock the beats together as well, so they never slip out. So that's very true. Nine Iron says, I never really use sync, but I definitely rely on the waveforms. I need to practice this. You know, if you're using CDJs, you can actually get a post-it note, you know, so you can't just turn them away. You actually get a post-it note and just cover up like that on the CDJ. That's another way of doing it. It's the way we teach in our Complete DJ course, actually. Uh, so you're not lost if you've got CDJs that tell you the BPM. Sandor says, 28 years ago, I learned myself on belt-driven turntables with two identical records. Once you've got that nailed, try two different tracks. Yeah, you can use two versions of the same track. Uh, that is uh, another way of making it a little bit easier for you. Dave says, I learned beat matching on my first set of decks in 2011 to the same Dead Mouse track. I knew when I heard the reverb, it was all good. Cool. Um, Scott says, you're still rocking the new pink headphones then. Yeah, although I've put the blue cable on them. We've done it because they match the ones on the book, right? You see what I've done there? I think they're quite cool. Opinion is divided on our headphones. I'm not going to lie to you about that. Uh, so, uh, and uh, more comments on manual beat mixing. Do you need to start it faster, says Jason. Surely it's good to train your ears to know when it's faster or slower. Well, it is, but it's hard enough as it is. So think of starting it faster like your trainer wheels right? It just makes it a bit easier to take those steps. The thing with manual beat mixing is you want to break it into as many small steps as possible. That's why I haven't talked to you about musical phrases today or key or anything like that. Because once you've got one step done, you can move on to the next and move on to the next. So, so break it down in that way. Uh, Jason says it's weird because this was the first skill you needed to learn when you were using vinyl and now it's almost a side skill. It's funny, isn't it? People now like, you know, I, I, I've learned to DJ on my phone then I'm going to get a controller, then I hope to get some CDJs, and finally I want to learn vinyl. And we're like, that's the reverse of how we did it. We started on vinyl, then we got CDJs, then we got a controller because they're damn cool, and now look, I can even do it on my phone. It's like, and I love that. I love the fact that people starting now with everything want to work back and learn where it came from. I think that's a cool thing to do. So if you're thinking that way, I'm not criticising you. I think it's awesome. Uh, so... More comments on manual beat mixing. Let's get one or two more up. Uh, Richard says, good advice, Phil. Breaking the teaching into stages. Uh, Dan Danilo says, what stand are you using for your laptop? Someone will share with you in the comments uh, about that. Uh, one of our team, that, so that is Danilo on Facebook team. If you can let Danilo know what kind of stand this is. Uh, Stevie says, it was nice to see a free DJ mix with Steve the Tutor last Thursday. Great job, you guys. Keep up the good work. So yeah, this course we've just launched, House Mixing Mastery, uh, there is a free lesson, a completely free lesson that we, we premiered on um, YouTube. And you can actually still watch that. So if you go to djtips.co slash free mix, uh, there's a full 20 minute lesson where we teach an acapella loop roll transition. It's everything you need in that lesson. We're not holding anything back. You can follow that and you could be doing it by the end of it. So if you fancy learning a house trick now, head there, djtips.co slash free mix to learn that one. Uh, so, uh, and one or two more comments. Uh, oh, got some love for the headphones. That's good. Uh, how do I mix with Virtual DJ on a Hercules Impulse 200? Plug in that little cable that came with it that will split up your headphones and your speakers and do exactly what I've shown you uh, today. Uh, Lee says, when beats are locked, sometimes the bass gets cancelled out. Right. Perfect example of what I was saying a minute ago of learning in stages. So yes, when you lock the beats, sometimes the bass drums kind of cancel each other out. It's called phasing. And in, in an ironic way, especially if you're using two copies of the same record, it shows you're getting very, very close to a perfect beat match. In real life, when we're DJing, we normally turn down the bass on one of our tracks and then swap it over with the other track at the point where we want the other track to dominate so that we we stop that problem of the two tracks. Start that one playing there. Let's get this one playing again over the top. So that's one bass. That's the other bass. One, the other, both. And two basses is pretty overpowering when you do it like that, which is why DJs kind of in real life will, will manipulate the bass in that way. But again, don't try and do that early on. There's time to learn that stuff. Thank you very much for pointing that one out, Lee. Uh, and I think we're done here for today. Um, TZ's just being 
uh, nostalgic. Boy, I learned on vinyl years and years ago. My dad's techniques, you're making me seem old now. My techniques are still up there from years and years ago. Uh, it's been a lot of fun doing this today. If you want more free lessons like this on our Tuesday tip slot, do let me know in the comments on Facebook and, uh, and YouTube. And let me know down there now, please, if you've enjoyed this today. Just for me to uh, let you know, I sort of tell, tell you where you could get a copy of the book. Uh, if you want to get a copy of the book, I, I want you to have one for free. Just go there, djtips.co slash join. As our latest member, it's free to join Digital DJ Tips. I'll give you a PDF download of this. Although you can get it on Kindle, all good bookshops, on audiobooks as well. So there's lots of ways of getting that book. Uh, but I'd like you to have, if, you, if the PDF is enough for you, just come and join us there and, uh, and we will uh, let you have a book that way. Uh, and if you're interested in the house mixing course, honestly, it's uh, the right time to get it because it's 35% off only for this launch week. That's the house mixing course. And if you learn what I just showed you now, you'll be able to get the most out of not only that mixing training, but all mixing in your DJing going forward. Uh, so thank you very much, people, for being here today. As always, it's just time for me to say, get good, get out there and make the moments. I'll see you in the same slot on Thursday for an open house Q&A. And I'll see you on Sunday, 25 minutes from now, wherever you are in the world. 25 minutes from this moment, uh, I'll be doing another house mix, probably live from my balcony, just five minutes walk that way. Uh, so I'd love you to join, let your hair down, hang out and listen to some music with me. Uh, but meanwhile, from me, uh, oh, look at that. How nice from Scott. This book encouraged me to pursue the DJ stuff. Glad I did. The learning curve is a little steep. Stick with it, Scott. Um, so yeah, uh, so we're out of here. Thank you very much, folks, for joining us today. Share this if you enjoyed it. That helps us to do this stuff. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.